All right, we looked last time at Thompson's article, uh, Defense of Abortion. Now we're going to take a look at an article that presents uh, an argument on the other side of this issue, uh, Mark, Don Marquis's article, Why Abortion is Immoral. <clears throat> Marquis writes that abortion is, except possibly in rare cases, seriously immoral. It is in the same moral category as killing an innocent adult human being. All right, so how does he arrive at this conclusion? <clears throat> he begins by asking a, a very general question. Why is it wrong to kill anyone? Uh, why is it wrong to kill you or me? Um, why is it wrong to kill someone? He goes on to say in the paper that we can't really understand the ethics of the abortion issue until we get clearer about why it's wrong to kill anyone at all. But he goes on to say that he finds that oftentimes when he puts this question to people, they come up with answers that are clearly not right. So he thinks there's a lot of confusion about why, in general, it would be wrong to kill anyone. And until we get clear on that issue, we can't really get clear on the ethics of the abortion issue. So he says that he puts this question to people. Why would it be wrong to kill you or me? Why is it wrong to kill anyone? puts this question to people, and the answers that he oftentimes get are clearly um, not correct answers. At least it seems clear to him that they're not, they're not the correct explanation for why it is wrong to kill someone. So let's all begin from the assumption that prima facie, that is to say at first glance, uh, assuming we're not talking about what I mean at first glance here is assuming that we're not talking about something like self-defense or maybe... Um, the death penalty if it's justified, or maybe killing someone in a, in a war if it's if the war is a just one. Here again, putting those kinds of cases aside in which killing might be morally justified, just in general, here again, um, why is it wrong to kill someone? Why is it wrong to kill anyone at all? Why would it be wrong to kill you or to kill me? One answer that people oftentimes give to this question is this. Um, it's wrong to kill someone because it coarsens the killer. That is to say, it desensitizes the killer to the badness of killing. So this is one answer that Marcos sometimes gets to this question. And he says, no, this, this can't possibly be the explanation for why it's wrong to kill someone. He goes on to argue that to say that killing is wrong because it desenses the killer to the badness of killing, because of the to say that it's wrong because of this coarsening effect that it has on the on the killer, uh, that gets the direction of explanation backwards. That is to say, the person is looking at two facts and the, and they think that the one explains the other, but really the causal relation is the other way around. Um, the person is looking at the fact that someone has been killed and the related fact that routinely killing people uh, does desensitize a killer to the badness of killing. And then a person looks at those two facts and says, oh, well, that second fact must, uh, must be the explanation for why killing is bad. But Marco says, no, that's to get the direction of explanation backwards. It's the other way around. It's the hideously immoral nature of the act that explains why it's so bad that the killer should become habituated to it. So yes, if someone routinely kills, that person becomes habituated to the to killing and is thereby desensitized to the badness of killing. But that doesn't explain why killing is that doesn't explain why it's wrong to kill someone. It's the other way around. It's because killing is as Marcus puts it here, it's because killing someone is so hideously immoral, that's what explains why it would be bad for somebody to be desensitized to the badness of killing. Okay, so he thinks that explanation clearly is not the explanation. That proposed explanation clearly fails to explain the badness, the wrongness of killing. When he presents this question to people, why is it wrong to kill someone? That is to say, why would it be wrong to kill anyone? Why would it be wrong to kill you or me? Again, we have to get clear what the answer to that question is before we can hope to have any clarity on the issue of abortion. Another common answer, uh, another answer that one commonly hears is this. 
It's wrong to kill someone because of the loss to the family and friends. Marquis thinks that that too clearly is not the explanation. Um, he says, no, for one thing, that wouldn't explain the wrongness of killing someone who has no family or friends. If someone was a hermit, someone had no family or friends, would that make it any less wrong to kill that person? I think most of us would agree, no, that would not be any less wrong to kill that individual just because that individual has no family or friends. So that clearly can't be the explanation. <clears throat> so Marquis goes on to claim that it's wrong to kill someone because of the loss that it inflicts on the victim. That is to say, because of what it does to the person killed. The reason these first two attempts at an explanation fail is they don't focus on what happens to the victim when, when, a, when a victim is killed. So here again, the first attempted explanation was killing is wrong because it desensitizes the killer to the badness of killing. Here again, that is not an explanation that focuses on what happens to the person killed. It's an explanation that focuses on someone else, in this case the killer. This second attempt at an explanation said that killing is wrong because of the loss suffered by the victim's family and friends. But again, that's not an explanation in terms of what happens to the person killed, the victim. This is an explanation that has to do with somebody else. But that's why neither of these explanations can be right, according to Marquis. Marquis's view is that whatever explains the wrongness of killing, it has to be something that ha has to do with the victim, the person who suffers the loss. So what explains the wrongness of killing has to be something about the loss that it inflicts on the victim. The explanation is not what happens to anyone else. So that's just one clarification that Marquis <clears throat> treats at the beginning of the article. Whatever it is that explains the wrongness of killing, it, it has to be something connected to what killing does to the victim, to the person killed. The explanation can't be what happens to somebody else. So that's why he rejects those first two attempts at an explanation for the wrongness of killing. So if the explanation has to be something to do with the loss that killing inflicts on the victim, then what is that loss? It's an interesting question, is it? isn't it? What is the loss to the person killed? Well, at one level, of course, the loss is the loss of one's biological life. But does that suffice to explain the wrongness of killing? Um, Marquis goes on to observe that the change of biological state doesn't seem to explain the wrongness of killing. What makes it wrong is connected to an effect of the loss of one's biological life. So let's just consider this explanation first. Um, the loss of one's biological life explains the wrongness of killing. Well, as we'll see later on uh, in our discussion of the article, Marquis believes that euthanasia is morally permissible, at least in some cases. That is to say, a person is terminally ill, and the person doesn't have anything to look forward to except suffering, and the person wants to be uh, wants that he should be allowed to die. Marquis thinks uh, it is, that is morally permissible. Now that person, and, and I think a lot of people would would agree with him uh, about that. Now, that person also, though, suffers uh, a change of biological state, the very same change of biological state, namely going from being alive to being dead. But in that case, Marquis believes that that is morally permissible. So the case, again, he, that he has in mind is a terminally ill person. Um, the person it, uh, cannot be cured and has nothing left to look forward to except suffering and wants to die and wants to be allowed to die. Is it morally permissible to allow that person to die? Marcus thinks the answer is yes, and I think a lot of people would, would agree with him about that. And since he thinks that that is morally permissible, uh, this can't be the explanation for why 
I'm sorry, this can't be the explanation <clears throat> of the loss to the person who was killed. That would explain why killing is wrong. Because in that case, the case of euthanasia, the person undergoes the same change of biological state, and yet in that case, that seems morally permissible to many people. But most people would agree that killing is prima facie seriously wrong. Again, by prima facie here, I mean at first glance, that is seriously wrong. Uh, I've explained earlier what I meant by at first glance here. So that doesn't seem to explain it. The change, the, the mere fact that one goes from being biologically alive to biologically dead doesn't seem to be the loss to the person who is killed. So what is the loss? Well, Marquis writes that the effect of the loss of my biological life is the loss to me of all those activities, projects, experiences, and enjoyments which would otherwise have constituted my future personal life. When I die, I am deprived of the value of my future. Inflicting this loss on me is ultimately what makes killing me wrong. So on Marquis's view, it isn't the mere loss of one's biological life that explains the wrongness of killing. It's, again, an effect, a natural effect of the loss of one's biological life. And the effect is the loss of all these sources of value that would otherwise have been one's future. What makes killing wrong is some natural effect of the killing, namely the loss of the victim's future. So Marquis's view is known as the loss of future account of the wrongness of killing. He discusses a few other, in this article, he discusses a few other accounts of the wrongness of killing. He discusses what he calls a personhood account of the wrongness of killing. Uh, that tends to be associated with utilitarian philosophers, but not them only. Um, he also discusses what he calls a sanctity of life account of the wrongness of killing. <clears throat> and both of those views are different from Marquis's account. Uh, a sanctity of life account of the wrongness of killing is uh, a common uh, account of this philosophical question. It's an old tradition. The sanctity of life view is an old tradition in Western philosophy. It goes back a long way. Um, but it begins from a religious premise. It begins from the premise that uh, life is something with sanctity. That is to say, life is something sacred. Life is something uh, holy. It's something given by God. And therefore, that's what explains why it's wrong to take an innocent human life. Uh, Marquis's account does not, uh, as you should have some sense from the reading, Marquis's account of the wrongness of killing and his account of the wrongness of abortion does not rely in any way on any religious premise. This is a completely naturalistic account. That's what it's called. That's what Marquis's kind of approach is sometimes called. It's sometimes called a naturalistic approach because he simply takes it as a truth of biology that every individual biological organism has a future. That's just a truth of biology. And that future includes many intrinsic values. That future includes many sources of value, such as here again, certain activities, certain projects, certain experiences, certain enjoyments. All of those are things that, uh, again, constitute your future personal life. Uh, Marquis takes all those facts to be perfectly naturalistic facts, just perfectly plain common sense truths of, uh, of biology. So, <clears throat> this is an argument against abortion that does not rely on any religious premises at all. And it's a misconception that many students have coming into this class that the only reason anyone would be opposed to abortion would be religious reasons. Uh, that's not true. That is a common misconception that I encounter. But um, I would, as I said earlier, I would encourage you not to read these articles through the lens of politics. And similarly, I would encourage you not to read them through the lens of religion, because I don't think either of those considerations, well, let me just put it this way. I don't think religious considerations really cut one way or the other as far as this issue goes, because <clears throat> there are people who are religious on both sides of the issue, and there are people who are not religious on both sides of the issue. So uh, again, uh, each of these uh, philosophers, Thompson and Marquis, they're arguing for a specific uh, position 
uh, and I would just uh, discourage you, you from trying to put political or religious labels uh, on it. Just take the arguments on their own terms. Um, so Marquis's account of the wrongness of killing is not um, this traditional sanctity of life account of the wrongness of killing. Um, for one thing, that view has the consequence that euthanasia would also be morally wrong, uh, but Marquis doesn't believe that, so we'll come to that a little bit later in the article. He believes that uh, euthanasia may be morally permissible. That is to say, if someone is terminally ill and doesn't have anything to look forward to except suffering and wants to be allowed to die, then Marquis believes that uh, in many cases is morally permissible because in that case uh, it's true that there may be no value left in, in the person's future. Marquis does not think that's a very common kind of case. He also talks later in this paper about a person who is suicidal and um, he seems to think, just going off that one example that he discusses, that oftentimes when people believe their, their future has no value, that's not true. Their beliefs about the value of their future oftentimes are false. They falsely believe that their future has no value, but it really does. And, and that's why we should encourage people not to commit suicide. That's why we should, we should discourage people from committing suicide. That's why we should encourage people to try to <clears throat> go through those painful experiences that sometimes do make it hard to see that one's future still has value, but we should encourage people to tough it out and go through those painful times in life because the belief that one's future has no value, uh, Marquis seems to believe that that belief is usually wrong. That's usually a false belief. So, um, but again, his view is different from a sanctity of life account. A sanctity of life account would have the consequence that euthanasia is also not morally permissible, but he doesn't believe that. And as we'll see later in the paper, on sanctity of life views, um, birth control is not morally permissible either, but Marquis doesn't believe that. So the sanctity of life uh, account of the wrongness of killing is one that begins from specifically religious premises, but, um, but Marquis is approaching the issue in, entirely in terms of um, premises that do not rely on any particular set of religious beliefs or on any relig religious beliefs at all. And he also mentions personhood views, and as I uh, mentioned earlier, a personhood account of the wrongness of killing. And on a personhood account of the wrongness of killing, what makes killing someone wrong is that a person has desires uh, to go on living, uh, a person has, is able to value his or her future, but on those kinds of accounts, typically personhood is seen as something that doesn't develop until until childhood. Um, so on those views, the fetus is not seen as a person. Um, from Marquis's point of view, it doesn't matter whether the fetus is a person. Uh, his, that would not, not, even if the fetus is not a person, that does not in any way affect that does not in any way affect his argument because his argument is in no way based on the premise that the fetus is a person. He takes it as a simple, uh, again, truth of biology, that a fetus is an individual biological organism and every individual biological organism has a future of value. Whether it's a person or not, it already has that. And that's what explains why it would be wrong to kill you or me. It would be wrong to kill you or me because it would deprive you of the value of your future. That's the property that explains the wrongness of killing on Marquis's approach, namely having a future of value. That's a property that the fetus has. And so from Marquis's point of view, um, as we saw him say at, at the outset here on the first slide here, uh, abortion is prima facie, seriously immoral, just as immoral as killing an innocent adult human being because they both have the property that explains both a fetus and a human, uh, an adult have the same property that explains the wrongness of killing. Uh, again, they both have a future of value and it's taking away all the value of someone's future that explains the wrongness of killing on Marquis's account. So again, Marquis's account of the wrongness of killing is oftentimes called the loss of future uh, account of the wrongness of killing. 
So the loss of future account explains, uh, Marquis says, the wrongness of killing generally, it explains the badness of dying, and it explains in particular why it would be wrong to kill infants and children. Um, it's a problem for personhood accounts of the wrongness of killing that <clears throat> on that account it would be morally permissible to kill an infant or to kill a child, even a very a very small child, because on those kinds of accounts, personhood as a psychological concept, personhood is the concept of psychological continuity. That is to say, when you can begin to conceive of yourself as existing over time, as existing in the future, when there's a kind of psychological continuity that begins to kick in. So think back to how far you can remember. For most people, that's four years old, maybe, maybe three years old. It's really only at that point that psychological continuity kicks in and, and that you're psychologically connected now to earlier stages of yourself. How far back? Going back typically like four or maybe in some cases for some people three. Um, that's really when personhood begins is when this psychological continuity begins where you're aware of yourself as existing over time. That's the concept of, of personhood as it's most commonly used in psychology anyway. <clears throat> As I said a moment ago, <clears throat> oftentimes <clears throat> supporters of abortion are basing their argument on what is called a personhood account of the wrongness of killing. And, and, and Marquis does discuss this, uh, this kind of account uh, a little bit in the paper. But again, that's not his account. His, on his account, it doesn't matter whether the fetus is a person or not. A problem for that view, here again on a personhood account, abortion is morally permissible because the fetus is not a person. But a problem for that view is that on that view, infants and the very small children are also not, are also not yet persons. And yet, it's obvious that it would be wrong to kill an infant or a child. So those kinds of views have a problem with explaining why that's wrong. So, Marquis argues that um, the loss of future account explains uh, a number of things that have to be explained by any adequate account of the wrongness of killing. Uh, on page 350, he says, This theory explains why we, re we regard killing as one of the worst crimes. Killing is especially wrong because it deprives the victim of more than any other crime. In the second place, he says, um, this theory, uh, people with AIDS or cancer who know they are dying believe, of course, that dying is a very bad thing for them. They believe that the loss of a future to them that they would otherwise have experienced is what makes their premature death a, a very bad thing for them. So Marquis says that his loss of future account of the wrongness of killing and the badness of dying can explain why, here again, uh, murder is the worst crime. It can explain why for someone to die prematurely is, is, is especially bad. Why premature death is, is an especially bad thing. Because that person still had so much value left in his or her future. And he goes on to say that uh, this is towards the bottom of 351. He says the claim that the primary wrong-making feature of a killing is the loss to the victim of the value of its future accounts for the wrongness of killing young children and infants directly. It makes the wrongness of such acts as obvious as we actually think it is. So his point is that it's obvious that it would be wrong to kill an infant or to kill a small child, and yet personhood accounts are not able to explain why that would be wrong because an infant and a very, or a very small child is not yet a person say a one-year-old or a two-year-old still is not a person as, as that term is used in psychology, as that term is used in these personhood accounts. But that's a problem for that kind of account. That's a problem for that kind of theory because it's obvious that killing infants and children is wrong. <clears throat> so Marquis advocates what has come to be known as this loss of future uh, account of the wrongness of killing, and he thinks that that explains a number of general moral uh, truths. 
So on Marquis's account, the property that explains the wrongness of killing, namely having a future of value, or he sometimes puts it this way, having a future like ours, that's a property that the fetus shares with adults. So again, what would make it wrong to kill you? Well, you have a future of value. Okay, well, if that property explains why it would be wrong to kill you, then it also explains why it would be wrong to kill a fetus, because a fetus has that same property, namely a future of value. So this is also sometimes called the future like ours account of the wrongness of killing. And to see that a fetus has a future like, uh, like yours uh, is not hard to see. What are some of the things that make your future valuable now? Just ask yourself that. Well, all of those things that make your future valuable to you now, all those things were in your future when you were a fetus too. There was a time when you were a fetus. So everything that was in your that is in your future now was in your future when you were a fetus. Here again, many things, of course, that were in your future when you were a fetus. Now, of course, that's in your past. So your fifth birthday and so forth, obviously, that's in your past now. That was a part of your future when you were a fetus. But of course, there's still a lot of things that make your future valuable now. And of course, all those things were already in your future when you were a fetus. So this is the property that explains the wrongness of killing, according to Marquis. Um, we've seen that on other views, there are other properties that explain the wrongness of killing. On a personhood approach, the wrongness of killing is explained by the fact that a person has a desire to go on living. So the wrongness of killing would be in part that it conflicts with the desire of a person. Uh, the person killed values his or her future. So uh, I, part of the wrongness of killing on that view would be that it conflicts with the values of um, the person. But here again, a problem for that kind of account then is that it would not be wrong to kill uh, an infant or a small child, but that's obviously wrong. So the future of value approach does have that strength as compared to personhood approaches. Uh, again, on some approaches to this issue, uh, personhood is the property that explains the wrongness of killing, um, but that is not Marquis's view. Marquis's view is that the wrongness of killing, as we've seen, is explained by a different property, namely this property of having a future of value or having a future like ours. And that's, again, a property that the fetus shares with adults. If that property, namely having a future of value, suffices to explain why it would be wrong to kill you, and the fetus also has that property, then that ex suffices to explain, according to Marquis, that suffices to show that it would be wrong to kill a fetus. That is to say, abortion is immoral. Marquis writes that the future of a fetus, quote, includes a set of experiences, projects, activities, and such, which are identical with the futures of adult human beings and are identical with the futures of young children. Since the reason that is sufficient to explain why it is wrong to kill human beings after the time of birth is a reason that also applies to fetuses, it follows that abortion is prima facie seriously wrong. So, again, there are lots of experiences, projects, activities that are the source of value in your future that make your future valuable. Maybe there's something that you intend to do on your 30th birthday that makes your future especially valuable, some experience that you're going to have. Well, again, if there's a time when if there was a time when you were a fetus, then that event, which is still in your future right now, was also in your future when you were a fetus. So this is Marquis's point. Fu uh, the fetus has a future that is identical um, to the futures of adult human beings. Not identical in the sense that everybody's going to have exactly the same experience, obviously. Uh, identical in the sense that the value of the future is made up by experiences, projects, activities. That's true of you right now, uh, and that's that was true of you already when you were a fetus. Again, it's not a religious premise that Marquis is coming from. It's a simple truth of biology, that an individual biological organism has a future. And in the case of 
human organisms in particular, that future is made up of projects, experiences, and activities that make that future valuable. Marquis writes that the category that is morally central to this analysis is the category of having a valuable future like ours. It is not the category of personhood. So there are other, are other accounts of the wrongness of killing, other philosophical accounts of why it's wrong to kill someone. <clears throat> a, a different kind of account from Marquis's, one that he discusses in the article in order to explain the difference between his view and this other view would be a personhood view. And on personhood accounts of the wrongness of killing, it's wrong to kill someone because it conflicts with that person's desire uh, to go on living. It conflicts with that person's plans for his or her future. But all those considerations really only apply to persons. Um, as that term is used in psychology, that is to say person, um, as that term is used in psychology, as it's used in philosophy of mind, personhood really only begins in childhood. That is to say, when psychological continuity kicks in, that is to say, when the different psychological stages of your life begin to be connected such that you can reflect on your past uh, and and, and look forward to your future and conceive of yourself as existing uh, in the future, conceive of yourself as existing in time, over time, when you become self-aware. That's where personhood begins, and that's in childhood. It's basically as far back as you can remember. If you can remember back to five, for some people maybe four, for some people maybe even three, that's where your psychological continuity begins. It's really only at that point that you become a person. And so on that view, on that kind of a view, uh, abortion is morally permissible. But here again, as I mentioned er earlier, the problem with that view is that infants and very small children are not persons in that sense um, either. Uh, on that view, a fetus is not a person, so abortion is morally permissible. But the problem for that view is that on that understanding of person, a person, an infant or even a very small child is not a person yet either, and nobody thinks that it's morally permissible to kill an infant or a, morally, or a very small child. So that's a problem for personhood approaches to this issue. Now, Marquis's account of the wrongness of killing here, again, is based on this idea that what makes killing wrong is it deprives the individual of the value of his or her future. And again, that's a property that the fetus has. Even if the fetus isn't a person at conception, it wouldn't follow that abortion is permissible on Marquis's view because that's not the relevant property as Marquis sees the issue. If there is an entity that has a future like ours, even if it isn't a person, it has the same property that explains the wrongness of killing an adult human being. So here again, we saw that Thompson says in her article that whether the fetus is a person is not relevant to my argument. And we see Marquis saying the same thing, but for different reasons. As we saw, Thompson's view is that abortion is morally permissible in some cases, as we see, uh, Marquis's view is that abortion is immoral, uh, except possibly in some rare cases. <clears throat> and on Marquis's view as well, it doesn't matter whether the fetus is a person, because being a person is not the relevant property that explains the wrongness of killing, according to Marquis. All right, so that's Marquis's account of the wrongness of killing, and that's Marquis's uh, account of why abortion is immoral. He discusses in the article uh, a few attempts to refute his account of the wrongness of killing. One criticism would go like this. You know, the concept of value implies that there is someone who values. Uh, it's not as if value just floats uh, around in the air unattached to anything. Value exists in, in the mind of an individual who values something. So the criticism would go, the concept of value implies that there is someone who has who values. But a fetus is incapable of valuing its future. So the objection would go, um, the fetus doesn't have a future of value. And of course, having a future of value is the wrongness making feature of killing, as Marcus calls it. He calls the feature of killing that makes it wrong is this feature that killing amounts to depriving the individual of the value of his or her future. 
All right, so that would be one objection, and that's an objection that Marquis discusses in the article. He says in reply, well, I may think in a period of despair that my future is of no worth whatsoever, but I may be wrong. Uh, my future may be valuable, valuable to me, even if I do not value it. This is the case when a young person attempts suicide, but is rescued and goes on to significant human achievements. Such young people's futures are valuable to them, even though such futures do not seem to be valuable to them at the moment of the attempted suicide. So in reply to this objection that, look, the fetus lacks the ability to value its future, Marcus points out, look, that, that could be true of you or me at any given time. You or I might falsely believe if we're going through some painful experience, if we're going through some period of despair, if we're suicidal, we may believe in that moment that our future has no value. But typically that belief is false. So, and here again, no one would think that it's morally permissible to kill you or me, but that could be true of you or me. It could be true of you or me that we lack the ability to value our future because of whatever we're going through at the moment. So that's Marquis's counterexample to that objection. <clears throat> Another objection to Marquis's account of the wrongness of killing would be that to have a right to life, uh, one would have to have the capacity to desire one's continued existence. The fetus lacks the capacity to desire its continued existence. Therefore, the fetus doesn't have a right to life. Marquis does not find that a persuasive objection either. He offers these counterexamples. He says, for example, well, one may have a right to be treated with a certain medical procedure, uh, because of a health insurance policy when it's purchased, even though one cannot conceive of the nature of the procedure. Okay, so here again, I might have never heard of an MRI before, so I lack the capacity to desire an MRI because I've never, maybe I've never even heard of it before. But I have a right to it because an MRI is covered by my uh, health insurance. And then maybe one day I do need one, okay, and then and then I become aware of what it was. Now, before I was aware of what it even was, I had no capacity to desire, to desire it since I didn't even know about it. Uh, but that just goes to show, lacking the capacity to desire something does not mean, according to Marquis, that you therefore don't have a right to it. And then maybe an even simpler example, counterexample to that objection would be this. As Marquis says, persons who have been rendered temporarily unconscious may be incapable of caring about something to which they have a right. So you may have a right to something, but when you're asleep, of course, you're not conscious of your desire uh, for that, whatever it is, um, for that thing to which uh, you have a right. So Marquis finds this to be not a persuasive uh, objection. Here again, somebody making this kind of objection to his account would probably be coming at the issue from the point of view of this kind of personhood approach to the issue. But again, as we've seen from Marquis, whether the fetus is a person is irrelevant to his argument. The fetus, even if it is not a person, already has the property that explains the wrongness of killing. It has a future of value. <clears throat> Towards the end of the article, he also discusses some logical implications of his account of the wrongness of killing. Marquis's account of the wrongness of killing does not have the consequence that euthanasia is immoral. So that would be a difference between his view and this other view that I mentioned, or this other view that he talks about in the paper, uh, a sanctity of life view, um, or a sanctity of life account of the wrongness of killing, would have the consequence that euthanasia is immoral, because on that view, killing is always, well, killing an innocent human being, the destruction of an innocent human life is, is always uh, immoral. But Marquis does not agree with that approach when it comes to this issue of euthanasia. He says, persons who are severely and incurably ill, who face a future of pain and despair, and who wish to die, will not have suffered a loss if they are killed. It is strictly speaking the value of a human's future which makes killing wrong in this theory, that is to say, in his own theory. In his theory, it's having a future of value that explains the wrongness of killing. The badness of being killed is that someone has taken away the value of your future. But in some cases, as he points here, it, it may be true that there really isn't any value left in the person's future. If the person is severely and incurably ill and has a future of nothing but pain and despair, then it may be morally permissible to allow that person to die if that's what the person wants. That is Marquis's view. 
So in his view um, of the wrongness of killing, euthanasia would not be immoral. Uh, again, as we've seen, he does believe abortion is, is, is immoral. And oftentimes those two beliefs do go together. Many people who believe that abortion is immoral also believe that euthanasia is immoral. But uh, again, Marquis is distinguishing his uh, account of the wrongness of killing from other accounts. And so uh, that is not a logical implication of his view. And then on this uh, sanctity of life view that he, uh, or this sanctity of life account of the wrongness of killing that he mentions in the paper, uh, it would also be true that birth control is immoral. That would be a logical implication of that view, the sanctity of life view. But that is not a logical implication of Marquis's account of the wrongness of killing. On a sanctity of life view, um, life is a sacred, it's a holy uh, thing, and it's uh, something that is God-given. Now, again, as I said earlier, this is a specifically religious approach um, to the issue. It depends on certain religious premises, which not everyone may share, um, but it is a common view. <clears throat> and again, the view would be, in this case, that because life is a God-given thing and our God-given human nature has the sexual aspect to it for the purpose of uh, procreation, to interfere with, it, with the natural consequences of uh, our reproductive biology, to, to impede it, to thwart it, would be contrary to God's will. Okay, so on the sanctity of life view, abortion, I'm sorry, uh, birth control is immoral. But that's not Marquis's view. Again, towards the end of the paper, he's distinguishing his uh, account of the wrongness of killing from certain other accounts. And on his view, it's not uh, an implication that birth control is immoral. Um, he says that at the time of contraception, there are hundreds of millions of sperm, one released ovum, and millions of possible combinations of all these. There is no actual combination at all. And he asks, is the subject of loss to be, mere, to be a merely possible combination? Uh, which one? The immorality of contraception is not entailed by the loss of a future like ours argument, simply because there is no non-arbitrarily identifiable subject of the loss in the case of contraception. So again, Marquis's approach is that what makes killing wrong, and by extension, what makes abortion wrong, is that it takes away uh, a future of value from an individual biological organism, which is what the embryo is after a very early stage in its development. But before conception, there isn't yet an actual individual biological organism that has a future. And so on Marquis's view, abortion, uh, I'm sorry, uh, on Marquis's view, it, let me start that again. It is not a logical implication of Marquis's view that birth control is immoral. 